Hey friend, Niklas here from Your Audio Solutions. Hope you're doing well. Today we have the best-selling author of books such as Step-by-Step -Step Mixing, How to Create Great Mixes Using Only 5 Plugins, and the founder of AudioIssues.com, Björgvin Benediktsen. It's always a pleasure talking to Björgvin. He always challenged me in my thinking, which is really, really great. I really love that, to be honest. Um, and it was a great interview, and I think you're going to learn a lot from it. And in this interview with Björgvin, we spoke about his uh, journey from Iceland to Spain and ending up in Tucson, Arizona, how he met Tim Ferriss and the impact Tim Ferriss has had on his business life and his personal life. We also talked about the difference of being an, an entrepreneur and an engineer. And we also spoke about why no one cares about your, you or your product. And Björgvin also mentioned something that I think many bands and artists out there are doing wrong. And that is they think their music is so good that they they deserve to be booked in venues to play their music live. When in fact, they should be thinking about which problem they can solve for the venue instead, rather than just thinking about, hey, my music is so good, book me for the show. Uh, that's not how it works. So Björgvin mentioned something really good for that. We also spend quite a lot of time talking about ads and Björgvin mentioned what you need to have in place in your business before you start running ads on social media and why his or how his philosophy differs from people like Ramit Sethi and Graham Cochran uh, who are all about not using ads. Uh, so that was quite interesting too. We also spoke about if an ad is annoying when it shows up in your feed, you know, as a promoted post. Um, I don't really click on them. I don't know if you do. Uh, if you do, please let me know in the comments and let me know if you think it's annoying or not. Uh, we spoke about that. Um, we also spoke about why you need to validate your business idea before you get going properly and so much more. It was a real pleasure and I think you're going to love this interview. But before we get into the interview with Björgvin, I want to tell you about a free guide you can download right away. It's called Three Tested Ways to Increase Your Client Base. And in this guide, you can learn my tested email script of how to contact bands online how to get clients in real life, so to speak, and how to get clients coming back for more. And you can get this guide by just entering your email address. It's free. There's a link to it below. But that's it. Now over to Björkvin Benediktsson. Uh, we are so awesome to have you here, Björkvin. Pleasure to talk to you, finally. Yeah, thanks for having um, looking forward to it um, um so i was looking at your facebook or following your journey on facebook uh sure. about your mad journey getting from iceland <laughs> back home because you were stuck in the whole coronavirus uh, thing right yeah yeah we were in iceland uh for my sister's wedding and then that's when uh uh, all the travel restrictions uh started coming down and we had a bunch of flights canceled and uh, a lot of uh, figuring out to do, and luckily we we uh, we managed to get home uh, after after three yeah three canceled flights, three reroutes, and uh, two nice ladies from Delta. Uh, wow. they, we we got a flight home. So yeah, that's crazy, man. Um, but so did you have to drive home? Was that a thing from from New York or something? No, no. Uh, we were supposed to connect through Denver, but then we had to go to JFK and then from JFK to Denver. But then that became JFK to Minneapolis to Denver. But we actually didn't have a flight from Denver at the end. So we were trying to figure out if there's a different way we could get get home instead of waiting like the eight, ten hours for the next fl flight. Right, right. And we decided we, th we were kicking around the idea of whether we should. Uh, drive from Denver to Tucson and just get a rental car. But mm. luckily in Minneapolis, we got put on a direct flight to Tucson, so we uh, didn't have to worry about it at all. Ah, that's good. But how how long, like, what's the distance between, like, a place like Denver and Tucson? Is it far? Yeah, it's like a 13-hour thir drive, probably. Ah. But it's like a two-hour flight, 13-hour drive. Yeah, that's pretty far, actually. <laughs> yeah. I'm yeah. glad you got the flight. Um, yeah, for sure. Yeah, the U.S. is pretty big. Yeah, exactly, man. 
Um, so where is Arizona anyway? I know this is a really big detour from our conversation, but uh, <laughs> is Arizona is that in, in the in the middle of U.S.? Where is it? No, it's in the southwest. It's it's ah. just just by California in there. Ah, okay, okay. So how far? Yeah, so borders Mexico. Mm-hmm. Border, yeah, borders Mexico. It's like eight hour drive to L.A. Uh, and Nevada is in the north. Um, and then and so Vegas is is seven hours drive from from here. So ah, okay. uh, yeah, so it's 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 very southwestern. Right, right, right. That's cool, man. Um, that's actually a good setup for my actual question, which I had. <laughs> okay. Uh, which is because I know you from Iceland. I guess people know you're from Iceland. For people who don't know you from Iceland, yeah, you're from Iceland. <laughs> uh, sure. So how did you end up in Tucson? Because I know you've been in Spain. Um, mm-hmm. So what's the story? What's the what's the journey? You know that got you to Arizona. Uh, well, the, the very very short answer is that I followed a girl, mm-hmm. <laughs> and. Uh, the longer answer is that I was studying audio engineering at the SA Institute in Madrid in Spain. Uh, and I met a girl there who was backpacking, Liz, who's uh, now my wife. Cool. Uh, she was backpacking through Europe and uh, we met through a mutual friend and uh, started hanging out. And uh, things got progressively more serious until she uh, stopped backpacking well she kept backpacking but she uh decided to move in with me in madrid to then use madrid as sort of her headquarters to to uh see the rest of europe it was also cheaper for her to to stay with me right and uh uh and then i told her you know it's a there's (laughs) there's a risk-free uh a satisfaction guarantee if you don't like it you can always leave (laughs) there's no problem there's no problem uh uh you know, I'll be sad, but if, if it doesn't work out, it won't work out, and you can always go somewhere. Uh, right. Your life r- fits into a, a backpack, so uh, it's it's an easy it's an easy choice. But luckily, it never came to that. And then uh, at the end of that year, or that school year, rather, I she went to um, she went back to the U.S. to study uh, law at the University of Arizona here in Tucson. Mm-hmm. And then I finished my studies in audio engineering. And then decided to follow her and see what Tucson was like and what it had to offer. And then from there, I instead of going and continuing my studies in audio engineering and getting a a, a degree in audio engineering, I just took the diploma, the vocational degree, if you will, mm-hmm. and uh, decided to go to the U of A, to the University of Arizona, and uh, study uh, business economics and entrepreneurship. So I went to the U.S. on an F-1 visa, visa and then uh, f- finished my studies, and then we got married shortly after that, and we've uh, been, you know, obviously we've been together ever since, and been together since 2009, wow. I believe, yeah. Wow. And, uh, so we've built a life together here. We have a house and a dog, and, and I have a recording studio on this side of the house, and she has a, a home office on the other, the other side of the, right, <laughs> the right, opposite right. wing, <laughs> <laughs> if you will. <laughs> uh, and, uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's a great life here in Tucson with her and, uh, nice. and doing nice. things, things here in the community and, and things, things of that nature. Mm. Mm. But so, so why did you choose why? SE in Spain and what was it about Spain that, you know, well, it was cheaper in? than most, uh, most campuses, SA Institute is all over the world. Mm. Um, mm. the Spanish campus was uh, more affordable for me. And it also had the sort of positive externality of, or added benefit that it uh, they have to learn Spanish. So I learned Spanish at the same time I was going to school. I had a really hard time first three months trying to figure out what people were saying. Uh, but I had taken some Spanish and I knew some Spanish beforehand, but uh, it was definitely... Uh, I was def- definitely ca- taking a, a, an elective in Spanish at the exact same time just by going to classes. That were all, all of the audio engineering topics were taught in Spanish, mm. so I had to learn uh, all of the terms in Spanish. Obviously, a lot of the terms 
are similar because like equalization for audio is is equalization in Spanish, so it's right, not right. very different. Right, but right. but obviously it's a completely different language, and I just really enjoy the Spanish language in general and languages in general. So mm. uh, I thought it was a fun additional challenge uh, for me to do. But so because I know you um, uh, are a fan of Tim Ferriss too. Um, yeah. Did you ever uh, do his Four Hour uh, Chef? Uh, the language thing? Oh, I don't think so. I actually met Tim Ferriss in Spain. Yeah, I wanted to ask that uh, too, actually. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I have all of his books. I've bought probably all of his books. I, I think he has, yeah, he has some like weird hack about learning languages because mm -hmm. he was trying to learn to teach himself Chinese or Japanese or something like that. Yeah, exactly. I didn't, I didn't dwell too much into it. It's, uh, it's probably useful and it's probably great for uh, getting short-term results, but I wholeheartedly believe that you need to immerse yourself in the culture and the language in order to sort of reprogram your brain so that you, yeah. uh, so that it becomes maybe not second nature, but uh, but pretty close to it. Uh, but it actually, it was it was a funny story. Uh, the first three months in, or yeah, first three months or so. When I was in Spain, I was in language school, mm. and I was just in uh, uh, a house with a bunch of other people, and we were like roommates and 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 the like. You know, you know how it goes. Mm -hmm. And um, I le uh, I learned from the I learned then I was following his blog, and he had just he was you know he's really riding the wave of the four hour work week at that point. This is in two thousand eight. Right, right. Fall fall of two thousand eight. He was. Um, the four hour work week had just come out in in Spanish, so it was a uh, it was being translated into Spanish. So he was on a uh, on a book tour of sorts, and I remember uh, seeing on his email list or something that there was going to be a get together at this random restaurant uh, that was like way out, like outside of well, not outside of Madrid, but it was. Uh, quite a few uh, metro stops away from anything close to the center but right. uh it was totally worth going there uh we got to hang out with a bunch of cool people and this was before i started any sort of online business uh thing so mm. i was picking his brain on because i was fascinated with the four hour work week i still have it it's signed cool. uh from that day and uh i've taken it to you know three uh yeah, at least two continents and I don't know how many countries. And uh, <clears throat> and I was fascinated with what he, what his me his methodology in general. And it was really great to be able to meet him and talk to him and sort of pick his brain. Even though, like, now, if I were to meet him again, I would have such different questions, of course. Right. Uh, because back then, I didn't know anything. I was a complete newbie. I didn't have... Uh, I had ideas about things, but I hadn't started anything truly. Right. And uh, but you so had read it the was, book before you met him, or yes, yeah, yeah. I'd read the book. Uh, this was back when uh, it was harder to buy books on. It was it was you could buy books on Amazon, but you would have to wait for the shipping, especially when you're shipping it to Iceland. So, mm -hmm. uh, but it was definitely a book that I uh, read cover to cover multiple times. I've read the second edition too. Mm -hmm. um, and I basically, I tell people that I just read the four hour work week and then I implemented every single strategy in that book and that's where I am today. And it really is sometimes as easy as that. Uh, obviously it's, it's maybe easy, but not simple mm. or the other way around. I can't remember which one makes more sense than the other one, but right. it's basically when you're reading things, uh, and don't apply what you learn, you're going to lose, you're going to, it's not going to be as valuable. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, yeah. So I really remember uh, thinking how I can implement everything that he was talking about. And mm. that's basically how Audio Issues got was born because I was creating these informational products or information and seeing if I could gain an audience by doing that. And I mean, cause, turns out it works. Yeah. I mean, yeah, obviously you did a tremendous job um, because I have also read the book and... I think I, I might just be stupid, but <laughs> uh, <laughs> it, it, it I, never resonated with me, or I didn't feel like I learned uh, enough, if that's the right word. Like I didn't feel like I, what I, what I, yeah, what I gathered from the book, I couldn't really implement 
properly or did, I didn't see the results like until someone like you explained like for example like we spoke about before archetypes and reading other books you know that's what I needed to do for some reason right. well I guess like if you were to think about it uh the one of the things that the book does not really adequately express is the uh the search of a problem because mm-hmm. all entrepreneurs or all businesses should exist to solve a problem for a, a target audience mm-hmm. and if you're if you have a solution that doesn't have a problem you're not an entrepreneur you're an engineer and you're right. making these uh fancy solutions for people that uh don't exist right. honestly mm-hmm. and but there are some examples in the books of like the, there's the guy with like the with the fancy french shirts and stuff like that and yeah, it's yeah, yeah. you know the today obviously the world the online world has changed uh incredibly mm-hmm. so a lot of the strategies may not work as well like i would never do the google ads strategy in that book right. but i do a very similar thing uh with my facebook advertising so it sort of teaches you the meta it teaches you what uh like it it gives you this like really broad overview and some specific examples but obviously i think big thing you have to think about before doing before implementing any tactic or creating a system is just you need a problem that you know people have you need a target audience that wants that problem solved and you need to know that there are enough people uh out there that uh you can serve mm-hmm. uh and from from there that's that's probably easier to take all the steps that are in that book and in other business books honestly yeah yeah i, mean, I feel like i need to revisit it again soon um that would probably be helpful <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, uh, definitely the second version is is pretty good. It's like more in depth. It's like the red one. Ah, uh, I don't. Mine know. is like. Is it? Mine is like a tattered, tattered white and uh, sort of a golden brown. Right. Uh, yeah, mine so. is purple. Yeah. Uh, oh, okay. I yeah, I mean, I mean, like you bought you bought it in uh, in the in the Europe, right? So yeah, 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 I'm yeah. sure there are I'm sure there are alternative covers that have been a b tested for a uk and european audience you yeah, know? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> probably um yeah but so what uh, impact um had that book have on your life you know beyond oh well, yeah business and and personal life i guess well it taught me that uh it it taught me that that what i thought was possible was actually possible hmm. you know it it gave me the courage to uh, to f- try to figure out you know location independence because here i was 20 something years old uh deciding to go either back home to the us stay in spain or whatever and there's one thing that was absolutely certain is that i could not have a job in which i had to go in somewhere nice. so the 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 main constant so like it's always good to have limitations to work within because then then you can uh, basically exclude everything else and then and then you focus on uh, how to solve a specific problem within the limitations that you're given and my main limitation was I have to be able to be location independent there is no other way of working mm-hmm. uh, and I got a freelance writing online writing job uh, to sort of pay some bills and get some uh, get some uh, side money while I was building audio issues and writing audio issues. Audio issues was really just a student project when I started it. And it was just a, a means of me writing down what I learned and hopefully pay it forward to others that either didn't have money to go to the school or, uh, or just were interested in knowing more about audio right. in general. And so it taught me... Uh, it gave me a system to at least start implementing. Uh, obviously, there's nuances in everything, and and although I have basically followed most things in that book, uh, my business model now is probably very very different than how I started modeling it after Tim's book. Mm. Uh, but it's um, it's definitely you know it it gave you the inspiration to like well this is a new frontier in a way it's like you know how many online businesses have have you know 
popped up in the last 10 years mm. you know i don't even know like thousands upon thousands right exactly, yeah. everybody is a everybody's a blogger with uh with a podcast or a youtube channel and has something to say and that's great um uh, and but if you don't have sort of the entrepreneurial mindset of um of treating those things as a business mm. uh you you will have a harder time making money from it so what does that mean? Like, what's the what's the difference there? Like in mindset. So, well, never not really thinking about yourself and thinking about others and how you can serve them, is probably the best way to explain it. Is that uh, nobody cares about me or my products. They care about what how I can help and what my products will help them solve. Hmm. Uh, so when you are thinking about, uh, I want to do this because of some selfish reason it'll make me famous or i'll be like well liked or known or whatever those reasons don't matter hmm. it's it's the what am i trying to do and who am i trying to help uh that should be more of a guiding factor than anything else i believe mm -hmm. and because when you when you flip your mindset towards the other person and because the because you know just as well as i do that uh, everybody's thinking about what's in it for me mm -hmm. yeah you know and uh, when you're always thinking about yourself in a what's in it for them uh, mindset, it's, it gets easier to see how you can help because the more you help and as long as you have uh, some, some structure and some business model in place in which you, know, you don't just help for free until you're out of money, there's obviously uh, some things that you that you uh, charge for and some things you, that you give away is especially true when it comes to content marketing mm. but content marketing which is how i built my business in the last 10 years and how many people build their businesses is content marketing is just storytelling uh um, and sharing your story so that they so that other people can relate to you but it has a business objective the content the content that you're creating has a business objective maybe it's going to your website uh, signing up to the email list, possibly buying one of my one of my books in in my, in, in my case, or my courses, or becoming a member, or hiring me to help you uh, mix your songs or whatnot, right? Mm. And um, so thinking about uh, just completely throwing away uh, the what's in it for me for yourself, and always be thinking what's in it for them, uh, and how how to think about uh, be problem oriented towards the customer that you want to serve. Uh, for instance, a musician that wants to play live because they deserve that they, they feel like their music is so good that it deserves to be heard is the wrong mindset to have. What you should be doing is that, yes, your music is probably really good. I'm not going to take that away from you. Your music is great. It probably deserves to be heard. But well, you know what the problem you're trying to solve when you're trying to get a bar to book you? The problem is the bar owner wondering whether uh, they're going to make payroll or they're going to sell enough alcohol or whatever yeah. so the problem you're trying to solve is an empty venue if you can solve an empty venue problem uh that's way more desirable to the bar owner or the venue booker or music booker or whatever because if you can draw a crowd it's a no-brainer because if you come with money it's easy to give some of that money back to you yeah yeah for sure and anyway, um, that's my soapbox yeah, yeah. <laughs> i mean that yeah that's very very fascinating i think um Especially talking about bands, for example, um, I don't think many bands have that mindset. I guess. Right. 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 Um, and also, maybe like home studio owners, for example, like because sometimes it can be hard to maybe define what problem are you solving? Are you solving as a as an engineer, for example? Are you solving yep. bad sounding music, or right. you know? Um, right. Well, so you can think of that in, in multiple different ways. I, uh, in my case, Audio Issues solves the problem of muddy mixes and mm -hmm. amateur demos. Mm -hmm. uh, and my solution and the results that I try to give people that buy my books and products and read my content is professional sounding radio ready mixes that they can be confident about finishing and proud to release. Mm -hmm. So there's some technical stuff there but it's also uh, a lot of the things that I'm selling is uh, confidence, self-confidence, 
and pride. So if you think of, if you're familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, mm. it's like the self-actualization at the top of the pyramid. That's sort of where I want people to, to go. And if I can help them out by just showing them how to use, you know, a few different processors to make their music sound good, that's great. Because at the end of the day, I want them to uh, remember me for having helped them make great sounding music that they can be proud of and proud to play to their friends because it's not easy uh, sitting down and writing a song that reveals some of your emotions and your soul in some way. And then it's even worse when uh, nobody cares about that song because it either sounds too bad or isn't properly fleshed out or, uh, or you know, hmm. a, a myriad of reasons. But so I want to help... Uh, I want to help give people sort of the the a, a path, a blueprint, or a or a guiding path to to being proud of what they're doing, right? And and knowing what what they're doing is good enough. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 cool, man. Um, I was just thinking uh, as he was speaking. <laughs> um, I mean, because yeah, you can you know obviously shift the mindset and solving a problem. Um, and let's say someone comes up with a problem. Let's say, oh, I think musicians have this issue. Uh, okay. But then you need to go the extra step step of confirming that issue, right? You can't just hope someone has it. Right, right. Well, you need to validate whether that problem is real. Yeah. You know, And maybe that problem is real, but it doesn't happen to enough people so that you're constantly going to have a hard time trying to get people to you know, purchase it. And it's also, if, if you have a small problem to solve and few people to solve it for hmm. that's a really uh, it's a really unstable business but if you have but if you have a huge problem to solve uh but still have few uh people to solve that still might be a viable business because those few people might be poor uh, corporations so yeah. at which point you know you need five fortune 500 companies selling you a uh, purchasing your services for a million dollars each a year mm -hmm. you have a five million dollar company yeah but if you're trying to sell you know if you're selling a ten dollar product to 20 people you're going you're you're not you're gonna set you're gonna be done serving that tiny tiny sliver of and that tiny niche immediately yeah uh so it's um i forget i forget what the, what the uh, catalyst question was Right, just yeah, how to validate your idea, I guess. Oh, so <laughs> or, how to validate? The, yeah, or the so, problem, I, I should say. Yeah. Well, first, I would. Well, I would. I would definitely like do my research. You have to do a lot of customer research, and and you know this because I made you do it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, and one of those ways is just to look for groups and websites and uh, other and other content that is created to solve that particular problem. If you think you can solve it better, faster, uh, or cheaper for than somebody else, uh, you just need to see whether that is being done uh, somewhere else. So it's it's great to actually find competition. Mm -hmm. If you're if you're trying to be like a super unicorn startup, maybe that's maybe you're trying to be so completely different that you're trying to create this perfect blue ocean that uh, that you're alone in, but ultimately that problem is still going to be similar to uh, some other problem that is being solved by current competition. Mm. So if you know that there's competition, you also know that there's demand for that for that solution. And at that point, you could you do your research, you try to figure out what which person can you help the most. Are you, for instance, in the music industry, you you know, are you trying to are you trying to cater to a specific genre, you know, that's uh, that's a different thing than you then you try to uh, you try to cater your problem solving to that specific genre and the people that are in there, uh, or are you? Um, oh, let's see. Then, like, what else would I say here? Um, it's basically just you know when you find the competition, maybe you can do it slightly differently, or or maybe you can uh, target an under just underserved um, audience that is that is in that niche. So say you have a co co competitor that is serving that is solving the same problem that you want to solve, hmm. but uh, it 
re- it solves the problem really poorly for a specific segment of the audience. Maybe that's the audience that you then make your company or you make your business a- around. You mm-hmm. know, for instance, like going back to the genres, if there's one rock producer in town, mm-hmm. uh, and and every time a rapper goes to that producer, they're unhappy. And you love hip hop, and you uh, can't get enough of 808 drums and and like mad flow or whatever Mm. uh maybe that's the segment that's being underserved in your community and then you try to target those people in particular so that you're taking you're technically not really taking business away from your competitor they're not doing the job that's necessary at that point and and in a way you can think of that being great for the competition because then they can niche down down even further then now they might might not actually do any hip-hop Mm. Yeah, yeah, and and you can you can think of this in, in, in multiple different ways. I'm just using music as an example because, yeah. uh, you know, yeah, yeah, it's what we do. Yeah, I mean, it makes total sense, man. Um, and it's something yeah I'm trying to do as well. Like when it comes to the studio or whatever music side of stuff, is to implement this same thinking. You know, to actually, you know, serve an audience and. You know, talk to the bands, not just hey, hey, I mix. You know, it's go deeper than that. That's why I find really, really important to do. Um, yeah. So Definitely. yeah, is what you're saying essentially. Um, it's really good. <laughs> um, I know you you touched uh, on ads before, and this is a, I guess it's a big topic because people are either using ads or people are against ads, and you sure. know, I know you use ads, I know other people use ads. Um, what is the benefit of using ads in your in your experience? Like, why use ads? Why sure. why start spending money on ads? I know this is a really long question. Sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but I, I, it's it's a great question. Uh, it's it's a, also a very fun one to answer because you can you you don't have to run ads if you don't want to, but there is still there is you still need to do something, and ads are sort of the fastest way to get an audience or get subscribers, but you can also do it through content, and uh, I like to talk about how there's two levers you can pull uh, when you're making a, a business, and it's it's either time or money. And so, ten years ago, I didn't have any money, so I had to use time. So I created content regularly, uh, wrote all all the time, published a lot. Now I think Audio Issues has over a thousand articles on music production in some way, recording, mixing, all those sorts of things. Sometimes they're just silly stories, honestly. Right. And But that compounds over time. Now, I, a lot of my, not a lot of people just find me on Google and subscribe to my list organically. So I've paid for that traffic with time. Mm. Uh, but however, time is pretty valuable as a resource. So now when you want to, maybe do something a little bit faster or you want to focus on creating products or serving current customers and not always trying to create new content for free, but I still do that, don't get me wrong, Uh, you can use ads to sort of supplement and or uh, supercharge your traffic. Mm. Uh, But you can't, you don't want to run ads if you don't know how to run ads. And the, the reason I... You know, I've spent a lot of money on Facebook and Instagram advertising throughout the years. And at first, probably the first year or so, I was um, I was not getting great results because I was also trying to figure it out how to do it. It's almost kind of like gambling in a way that you're running ads to and then you hope for a specific result. You just have to wait longer than a dice roll or a or a or a card <laughs> or a, car, a hand of a hand of uh, on on poker or, or a blackjack or whatever. Right. But but uh, you also don't want to run ads to a business that isn't systemized enough to take that traffic and do something with it. Mm. So like if you don't have an email funnel already set up, if you don't have products to sell, if you don't know. Uh, what you're going to do with the subscribers when they get to your page and possibly subscribe to your newsletter or buy your products or whatnot. If you, if you don't have the back end and the central, uh, central hub of your business, like locked in, you're going to waste money on ads because you're sending people, you're buy you're basically buying 
eyeballs to go somewhere that they then get lost and wander off and right. you're not going to get that money back. Right. Uh, whereas with me, when people come to, when people see an ad, they click on an ad, it goes to a landing page. The landing page has one purpose is to get them to subscribe to the email list in exchange for the email address. They get something that I think is valuable. It's a short, quick term, quick solution to a problem. I already know they have, whether that's a muddy mix or I uh, don't know what to do when they're mixing or whatnot. Right. Mm -hmm. They get that. At which point my email marketing system takes over and sends them uh, relevant uh, and useful information that teaches them even more so that I give them even more value because my goal is to help them uh, help them improve their mixes and music in general. But my, my goal is also to, uh, uh, to create, create trust. I want them to know, like, and trust me so that at a certain point when I do offer products or when I run specials or when I um, open the doors to my insiders mu membership community or, you know, have some sort of promotion for something else, a percentage of them, uh, I've, I've shown them enough goodwill so that pe some people are willing to take the next step and invest in themselves by uh, purchasing one of my products that I know are helpful because I've gotten too many uh, positive reviews of my books and my courses. There are too many musicians that have emailed me that have said that I've been ha helped them make an impact with their music. I know I, I have the, I have probably about a hundred songs on a Spotify playlist that's all just from musicians and engineers that have uh, told me personally that hey I released this because you helped me. Um, you help me understand how to do something in the in the studio world, yeah, and awesome. so, yeah. So, uh, obviously, some subscribers and some people that are in are in your audience may never buy anything from you. There's multiple reasons why that can be. Uh, some people uh, some people will only buy on if there's a discount, hmm. uh, and some people just live in other parts of the world where the exchange rate is terrible. Yeah. Uh, the cost of living is higher. They just can't afford it, or they don't have time to digest the uh, courses or the materials that they buy, so they don't see a point in taking a bigger step because they're happy just getting the occasional email and the occasional free thing, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but if you don't have that, and then obviously when you become a s customer, my uh, customer res um, resource uh, or customer relationship uh, or um, educational management system, which I use Kajabi now, uh, kind of takes over, and I can, and that's where my premium courses are, and where my membership is, and that's also where I can. Um, uh, what did I say? That's also where I can uh, continue to have a con conversation with them. Right. You know, because if they are working on their music, they're not just working on the same song. Well, hopefully not working on the same song uh, forever. Yeah. They're gonna be. They're gonna have new problems that they might talk to me about. At which point, I might create new content for them, or create a new course for them, or uh, they come on board as a uh, as a student f through my mixed coaching program. Those sorts of things. Yeah. Um, but I know both of us um, uh, like Ramit Sethi, right? Um, yeah. And um, I saw he. Yeah, he's he, all right. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I saw he, he released a course um, a few weeks ago, just before the whole coronavirus thing. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. forgot what it was called. Uh, Earnable. I think it was the one before that. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, yeah, Earnable just closed last yeah. week. I think it, he reopened Endless Audience or something like that. Yeah, I think too. it's that one, maybe. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But he made this big, big thing about... And not using ads on 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 Facebook. I know. Well. I read that email. Yeah, me too. And I just yeah. And Graham Graham Cochran says the same thing. He yeah, doesn't yeah. use. Yeah. Um, uh, which is you know that's that's fine. Uh, uh, business just like mixing business works in a lot of different ways. And uh, yeah. if it works for you, that works for you. Uh, I think one of Graham's major strengths is his uh, YouTube following because he has like a half a million YouTube followers. Yeah. So he's probably getting a lot of traffic from that. And then Ramit Sethi is like, you know, if you're a New York Times bestselling author multiple times, hmm. maybe you don't need to buy advertising. 
Yeah. But do, but, you, you, know, do, know. do you also like track your ads to see like, well, you know, like what Ramit said, for example, like you spend a certain amount of ad, do you then? Yeah. Oh, you, yeah. So you, you're not wasting yeah, so, money. Uh, so I try to get, um, I'm happy if my cost per lead or cost per subscriber hovers between uh, uh, one to two dollars. Right. If it's more than that, uh, it, my math uh, it doesn't work really. Right. Right. Um, and it's hard to see when their revenue, when I when they break even, because there can be subscribers that buy the book immediately and then never buy anything again, and then there can be the subscribers that never buy the book, but they'll buy uh, the premium $90 product or they'll buy, you know, an affiliate course that I'm selling for somebody else, uh, you know, six months to two years from now. So it's really hard to uh, manage the ROI per um, per subscriber. But I think as an overall math problem, it's just that Ad spending is gonna is is usually about twenty to thirty percent of my costs. Right, right, right. And that that works out for me. It's yeah. just like yeah. uh, business is business is very mathematical at a high level. Hmm. Uh, and as long as you can, you know, crunch some numbers to get some conversion rates going, then you at least have some uh, constants uh, in your equation. Hmm. Uh, because if you get, you know, if you know that you get a 1% conversion rate uh, to sales and you get a 10% conversion rate to um, to your traffic, mm-hmm. then out of 100, out of 100 uh, browsers, you get 10 subscribers, right? Uh, and Well, you, you, I have to extrapolate further because it has to be in the thousand. So right. if you get... Uh, Let's say you get a fifty percent. Uh, like for me, I get about a fifty percent conversion rate from my landing pages. So out of everybody uh, who lands on my landing pages, uh, out of out of a thousand, uh, five hundred people will sign up. Hmm. And then if out of those five hundred people, if I sell ten uh, percent, uh, if ten percent of those people buy uh, a nine dollar product, uh, that's what. F- uh, 50 90? times nine, right? Yeah. Oh, is it? Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> so, so like at that point, if you if you can know at least some of your numbers, mm. then you can do some of the math. Mm. Uh, but uh, you're fooling yourself if you can just like always and and like not if you you're fooling yourself if you can if you think you don't have to evolve and constantly be creating something new and constantly actually be running your business. Right. I don't think. The, the whole passive income, like work from the beach, uh, make money in your sleep is sort of a, a figment of your imagination. Yeah. Also, it's it's not it's very hard to work on the beach, especially if you're a recording engineer. But <laughs> exactly. And also, you know, the sun, it, the sun glares your screen. You can't see what you're writing. But exactly. Uh, you also will get bored because if you're the type of person that is an entrepreneur, you don't like you get bored very easily. Mm hmm. So you're always wanting to do something. Obviously, go on vacations if your if your uh, if your sales uh, l- let you. Mm. You know, I'm all for work life balance. But if you think you can set something up and just walk away from it, I don't know if that's really true. Especially not in in this sort of solopreneur world that we live in. Yeah, 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 totally, man. I mean, yeah, it's definitely a dream. Many try to sell that you can work yeah. from the beach, but yeah. And I and I also just like serving my audience. I like teaching. Mm. Uh, I like teaching people, and I like listening to new music that my uh, subscribers and customers send me. Yeah, because sure. you know, that's that's just like there's a reason I'm in the music industry. It's because it's the best one for me. Yeah, <laughs> and, exactly. Uh, uh, so like, uh, I don't really want to walk away from audio issues, even if it worked on autopilot, because I would miss it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It makes sense, man. Um, and then I also know you have your uh, studio, right? Or is a yeah. Uh, so what's it called Iceland? What's it called? Yeah, I, I ran this. Yeah, I ran a studio. Just we we needed a name for the studio. We called it Icelandic Embassy Studio oh, yeah, because that's, that's what my wi- that's yeah. what my Wi-Fi was called at the <laughs> at the time. Um, and it, we recorded a bunch of local bands, and it was just in here. Like we put the the drums in the corner we got some really good home recordings 
uh, some really fun, fun times, but I've sort of graduated into just doing more mixing because it's a better room for mixing. I am better at mixing. Mm. Uh, and I'm also more useful when I'm teaching uh, my audience how to mix. So I'm more of a mixing engineer and an audio educator now. So I don't really run the Icelandic Embassy Studios as a separate entity or a business these days. Uh, everything is really just through audio issues. So right, right. Um, if you if you want me to mix your song or want me to coach you on mixing your song, that's just an audio issues service now. Also, also mixing other bands is also audio issues, or yeah, like I'll mix uh, I'll mix the occasional song and 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 I'll have. But I I honestly really like teaching them how to do it themselves, and then I'll you know I I've started doing more mix coaching and mastering, so I'll coach you how to make your mix sound as good as you can, right. and then because. I feel like a mastering engineer will have a different set of ears, or obviously will have a different set of ears. So I tend to take them their final mix and master it for them. Right, so right. it gives them, it's a more cost-effective way for them to make, uh, uh, to get great-sounding music. Yeah, yeah, for sure, man. Um, and just going back to the ad ads part again, because uh, you mentioned sure. you need to have some stuff in place, you know, the yeah. whole back end, so to speak. Um, what are some of the other stuff people should do before, you know, spending money on ads? Uh, well, definitely all of the system, all of the website systems and mm -hmm. the online. So, so your website, your landing page, your email marketing funnel, uh, audit, some automated emails, or at least an idea of what you're going to do to the, for the e email subscribers when they come in. Mm. Um, and then you also need to find your audience uh, and then and need to target the right people so that your ads aren't being shown to people that wouldn't care about whatever it is you're you're solving or serving um, uh, and I use lookalike audiences and custom audiences for that which are based on my web traffic based on my email list and my customer lists uh, and then based on my knowledge of the industry so uh, I target people that like, you know, all the audio software, all the DAWs, like Logic and Pro Tools and Sonar and and Ableton and all these things. And then also just the the audio equipment manufacturer, like, you know, Shure, Audio Technica, Slate, um, any, you know, Behringer, Universal Audio, hmm. Presonus, Yamaha. Now I'm just naming things in my room. <laughs> 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 uh, and then you know genres of music, and then just the the just the general description of 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 their interests, which is like music mixing and sound recording and reproduction and home recording and recording music and audio engineer and audio engineering society. Those sorts of things are things that I create little Venn diagrams around to so that uh, I target the the person that I can uh, serve the best. Mm -hmm. But do you also stay local, or do you go worldwide straight away? Or Wor worldwide, mostly uh, English-speaking countries. Right. So I have uh, in my insiders group, I have uh, you know, music rock musicians from Ohio, uh, classic rock punk, uh, like sort of jangly punk guys from from the UK. Uh, a dub, a dub saxophonist from Berlin, or he lives in Berlin. Uh, a friend of my, uh, one of my customers, uh, his name is Kel. He's from Sweden, but or he, he's from Norway, but lives in Sweden. Oh. Um, uh, Yevan, he is from Australia. He just became an Insiders member. I did a mix, I did a mix walkthrough for him years ago. He's still on my email list now. He's like a regular paying member. Cool. So I have all over, but as you can it's mostly english-speaking countries or or countries where you kind of have to learn english mm. to uh to learn some of this some of the stuff some of the this particular right, techniques right. And stuff. right yeah that makes sense um yeah. and is there anything else we missed there like what you need to know so yeah researching your audience yeah yeah and then just writing yeah and then just writing good copy writing having copywriting skills so that your ads are engaging and compelling that makes people click through mm. to them to see 
to see the next step and then hopefully your landing page also has good copywriting so that you they become subscribers and then again That's hopefully it. your email copy is good and your sales page copy is good mm. yeah exactly you know, so. um, copywriting is a very underrated skill uh if you don't know of it but once you get familiar with it it blows your mind right do you have any good resources on that like tips on books or whatever you can uh do? yeah i think there's a how to write copy that sells i think that's ray edwards Hmm. Uh, that one's super good. Um, copyblogger.com overall has a really good resource for copywriting in general for bloggers and online businesses. Um, Ramit's Ultimate Guide to Email Marketing and Content Marketing or Creating Remarkable Content is pretty good. Um, is that a course or that's just a PDF? No, it's just a giant ultimate guide online. Ah, yeah. I need to look it's it like up, a, actually. Yeah, and then... Um, it's funny you're talking about uh, Ramit earlier because I'm also on Primo's uh, email list. He used to be the uh, used to be one of the star students in Zero to Launch, and then he has his own uh, business that helps online business owners in particular. And he's taking a real interesting, drastic stance against. Uh, online courses because the online course completion rate is pretty low so he only does live calls and live courses and things like that because it, it makes a bigger impact because mm. if you're making courses for people uh and then you can sell them but if then if people don't finish them mm. uh you're not actually giving them the results that they need you're not actually solving their problem you can say that they're not solving their own problem and you've given them the solution but at the same time I'd rather get success stories than uh, just revenue. Yeah, you know? yeah, exactly. Um, that's a very interesting point, you know. Uh, I wonder, I do wonder how many, yeah, like you said, are not completed. It must be I, a large yeah. amount then, I guess. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I've I've certainly bought courses that I've never finished. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a good thing to, for people to think about, I guess. Yeah. Um, and... So what's the downside of using ads then, if there isn't a downside? Uh, I mean, there's a, uh, well, obviously if you don't have money to spend on the ads. Sure. Uh, because like I run ads on a credit card and if you are, uh, if you're irresponsible with your credit, uh, then I can come by you, uh, in the ass for sure. Mm. Um, you get a lot of like trolls and haters that love commenting on ads because they have an opinion and 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 I tend to have to monitor ads and sort of moderate them. Right. Uh, sometimes I sometimes I like I actually do tend to troll the trolls back with like silly gifts and and uh, and you know overall silliness and and, and cynicism because. If you honestly like, I think uh, if you're the type of person that starts arguing with a brand in the comment section, uh, I'm pretty sure you're not gonna be a customer of mine. Mm. So you sort of let your guard down and you showed your hand pretty easy, pretty quickly. So I'm gonna take the opportunity and and sort of, you know, make silly gifts and 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 sort of uh, take the piss out of you, as they say in the UK. Yeah. Uh, because because uh well first of all if you're a real troll and a hater you hate that sort of thing so you will keep commenting on it because you ne you need to have the last word and if all i'm doing is responding with gifts uh we're not really having having an argument i'm just reading your comment and just and sort of ignoring it while still engaging with you and what trolls don't understand is that every time you react or engage with me on an ad, that's free publicity for me. Yeah. Because yeah. that <laughs> ad is keeps popping up around like and keeps popping up on other people's feeds. So mm. uh, the more well, I wouldn't I shouldn't open this can of worms, but the more <laughs> trolls on my ads actually might be uh, will show will will show to more people. Right. Yeah, I mean uh, I can see that. <laughs> Yeah. So that's that's definitely the downside. Another potential downside that I could think about would be like uh, if you have any limitations on the software that is taking over, you know. So like if 
if you can only get an X amount of subscribers per month and after a certain amount, you know, you have to pay more. Uh, right. You have to take take that into account when you're figuring out your cost structure. Uh, and then also fulfillment. If you're not selling digital products, uh, because digital products, there, there's uh, you, there's infinite fulfillment, right? You yeah. don't need anybody, as many people can buy as, as possible until the servers crash. Mm -hmm. And as long as you have a strong enough uh, infrastructure in that way, you're using a software that's, that's uh, respectable, that shouldn't be a problem. But if you're selling uh, physical products or services that require your time, uh, you might get too many subscribers to your, uh, so you, you're at capacity and then you're, you paid for all this, all these extra subscribers that you actually didn't need. So right, right. I would ramp up spending slowly. Right. Like I spent, I spend over a hundred dollars a day often on ads and that's not even that much. Like I have a friend that run, that helps Shopify owners with their e-commerce and he, he, He's running like uh, when he did uh, help them with Black Friday. Hmm. Uh, I think they were running about fifty grand in ads a day. Wow! Yeah. <laughs> <All right. laughs> I hope they didn't make it back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, it, I, I think so. And yeah. So like, uh, but that's some high level uh, risk taking for sure. And it's also you know, but if you know. If you know that you can just open a faucet and it's gonna do well, like that's great. Mm, mm, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's funny that ads is this, you know, uh, topic of, you know, uh, what's it called, like a sacred cow sort of thing or whatever it's called. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you should always run advertising or not. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, like it's bad if you do it or, you know, stuff like that. And people like myself don't really understand it. That's why I don't do it myself. Uh, right, but yeah, it's definitely something to learn more about and investigate. I think. Um, yeah, for anyone for sure. interested, you know. For sure. Um, yeah. So. And then Google Ads are a completely different beast. Like I have right. no knowledge of Google Ads. Right. So only use you only use Facebook and Instagram. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I bet that, that yeah probably a whole not a beast then I guess. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's a completely different ballgame. I mean. But that's also, that's also my, my, my question about ads. Um, like, do people actually click, you know, like when you see, you see it, it's promoted, you know, sure. does that put people off or not? That's always been my wonder. I don't, you know? I don't know. Uh, probably, I mean, probably to some. I mean, I don't think there is a question like that that can't be answered. Of course, some people are going to be pissed off. Mm. Uh, but... Some people, because I'm actually trying to give you, give my audience, you know, relevant and useful information, yeah. most of it for free. Um, I don't, uh, I don't find that it should be uh, intrusive because if you, if you're into this, into the things that I talk about, maybe we can be friends. Maybe we can, maybe you uh, will enjoy hanging out with me and, and reading my emails because they're valuable to you. Uh, and to be honest, I'd rather get a sponsored ad about something that I'm interested in than a sponsored ad about something that like is just cluttering up my feed. Yeah. Um, yes, yeah, so, I mean, I guess it's down to people who, who um, you know, don't know how to do the ads properly maybe. That's why it feels like a spam, essentially. Yeah, you know right. uh, that could be a thing. I guess. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, like you could you could think of it that way, but uh, that's just it's that's not actually what spam is. So right, sure. I mean, yeah, I, I see your point, man, and it, it's uh, it's valid. You know, uh, <laughs> I think it's really good. Um, I'm gonna get into it for sure. Um, yeah. Well, let's start slowly and, and yeah, yeah, and of course. Uh, read about it and don't stuff. take too many risks. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so what's the future for audio issues now? Cause you've been yeah doing it for 10 years. Um, yep. do you want to take it somewhere else? Do you want to do more videos or what's the, what's the plan? Yeah. So I'm not sure where the video content is going, but I, the, I just opened up a membership only, uh, insiders community, I call it in September and 
it's opened up but just a couple of times and and that's sort of where i focus a lot of my efforts is is to find the musicians that are really dedicated to improving their craft and releasing songs and i'm trying to serve them better and then i'm always just looking for uh music that i like to help out in some way uh, doing a lot more mastering these days doing a lot more one-on-one -on -one coaching uh, and I, I'm also doing customer only mix, uh, like live streams of mixing mixes. So I do like live classes. I actually hate recording video. Um, and, but I'm much, it's much easier for me to, to improv on the spot and just, you know, get people to come to a live class and then I'm just going to teach it live and it's way easier that way. And especially if you record those classes, you just have that, you yeah, know, exactly. you don't have to worry about it. Yeah. So, uh, basically, just keep keep improving my own skills by working on my students' mixes, and keep um, helping those who are releasing songs to get you know uh, to understand sort of the online presence and marketing that's required in the sort of independent musician world, and uh, and then I'm I'm working on a few writing projects too. I don't know what that ends will end up being, but there's definitely another book. Uh, coming um, cool. I wouldn't say soon but it's being worked on <laughs> nice yeah that's exciting man yeah very cool um, and uh, you know we mentioned Tim Ferriss in the beginning so I thought it would be nice to end with a classic Tim Ferriss question <laughs> okay uh, maybe maybe you listen to his podcast too um, but I like his question about favorite failures you know uh, so I'm wondering if you have a favorite failure, you know, in your business life or it's your personal life, yeah. whatever it can be. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, my favorite failure is my first product that I created for Audio Issues, which was, a, it's called Audio Notes, and it was a notebook for studio engineers based on the old track sheets that people did in, in back in the old home, the old commercial studio days. And it was a complete failure nobody bought it uh well i i sold a few copies but not not enough at all but failing at that taught me how to outsource uh design uh to designers how to come up with a fulfillment process how to figure out to uh create a shopping cart online how to write sales emails even if they were bad how to create uh sales pages even if they were bad. Uh, and so failing at your first product means that you know how to make a product. Right. And that's a really good lesson to have. Yeah. Uh, you, just need, you just need to focus more on customer development and product development uh, for the next one. And that's what I did. And I, uh, a lot of, that's why a lot of my uh, products are information products, courses, and books, because that's what my audience wants. Right. Yeah, that's very cool, man. So you actually failed forward, so to speak. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the way to go. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Awesome, man. I mean, that sounds cool, though. I mean, the, yeah, that sounds like a cool product, though, the the notes thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I've, I've thought about re redoing it because no, notebooks have gotten a resurgence in the last few years, but and I would definitely do it in a different way. It would be more closer to sort of a a five minute journal or a journal of some sort rather than just this notebook. So, but I haven't, I haven't thought too much about it. Right. 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 Um, awesome, man. So before we wrap up, where can people find more info about you, you know, your service, your products, for example? Yeah. So everything, uh, can be found at audioissues.com or audio issues.com. Um, feel free to subscribe to the email list if, if it is something that you'd like to learn more about mixing and home studio production, uh, you feel free to email me from from there if you want to get in touch uh, for any reason, whether that is uh, just to say, hey, I listened to this and uh, it was enjoyable. I don't. I always like um, I always like compliments because who doesn't? Yeah. And uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, so that's probably the best place to go. And then on. You know, I'm audio issues everywhere else. I'm mostly on Instagram and Facebook, so it's at audio issues there. And then uh, the YouTube channel is active, but it doesn't have a ton of content on it. But that will change. Cool. Yeah, I'll link to all that below, so people can check Great. it out. Um, Very cool. 
Awesome, Bjorgen. It was a pleasure having you on. A nice yeah, thanks for having me. This is great. Awesome, man. Yeah. Thank you, Bjorgen, for coming on to the show. It was awesome talking to you. And I hope you, the listener, enjoyed it as well. If you have any questions or comments about what we spoke about, leave that in the comments below. Don't forget to download the free guide, Three Tested Ways to Increase Your Client Base. It's free. You just enter your email address and I'll send it to you right away. And if you're listening to this on Apple Podcasts, please leave a rating um, and a comment if you, if you want to. That would be awesome. But that's it for this week. I'll see you guys soon. Bye.